Okay, so now we switch to, uh, to, to English. We're very happy to have you here, Brian, from uh, Silver Spring Networks. You are one of the companies that work uh, in the world, uh, uh, that work on a daily basis in projects like this, uh, with this kind of focus or aim. Um, so I guess you're, you're quite aware of, of uh, issues, problems, uh, opportunities. Uh, you have a lot of experience from this, more than most, I would say. Um, so we're very happy to have you here. Um, I think maybe I should say also since you are, uh, please come up, since you are uh, from one of the companies, as they say in Swedish television, that there are other suppliers also of these of kind course. of services. <laughs> of course. Uh, but it's really great to have you here because you work with this every day, more or less. Great. So, uh, well, no, thanks for, thanks for having me. And thanks for putting up with my English as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah, take okay, it away. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Today, I was going to talk to you a bit about um, really what we're seeing happening in the smart cities market. Um, as Jonas said, we are, uh, uh, as a business, we're involved in lots of different projects uh, around the world in the smart cities uh, in fact, many of the, the markets that were discussed in the presentation earlier. And so I thought I'd touch on some of the trends that we're starting to see emerge as the market picks up pace. So first of all, who are we? So Silver Spring Networks provide the communication and data platforms for uh, cities and utilities to connect up with the, all, the, all the assets, all the devices that they are interested in. So we, we very much focus on enabling that connectivity to all the devices that, that appeared in the, the the videos actually you watched and and, um, and that evolving picture and uh, we've now got networks in about 500 cities around the world uh, we connect over 25 million things all different shapes and sizes uh, and we we handle a lot of data so this is generally uh, we, we don't typically connect things like smartphones or computers that handle lots of data instead it's uh, devices that are sending small amounts of data frequently so um, the internet of things as it's often referred to we're about 13 years old so it used to be called telematics and then it was machine to machine and now it's internet of things so we'll see what it's called next we've generally focused on applications that require very high reliability so we, we started in the smart grid market and so uh, applications that are perhaps tied to security or uh, have revenue tied to them and, and that's really the area we've we've typically focused but that that's kind of evolving as the market expands so I thought briefly before before coming on to smart cities I would give you a, a short history on um, what we saw happening in the smart grid market which was I guess faster or earlier to move in the the IOT space than than some others um, and for many of the utilities around the world the smart grid journey started with with this they were looking to replace their uh, electricity meters with a, a remotely readable meter um, and this was when our company was formed uh, around 13 14 years ago when the many of the US utilities and other utilities around the world uh, decided they wanted to do this and they, they started off with quite a simple business case they wanted to avoid estimated bills they wanted to avoid having to go and visit their customers uh, to get readings and they also wanted to be able to roll out new tariffs that changed in price during the day so they would need half hourly in information to be able to do that and so um, so we were lucky enough to be involved in some of the early uh, early projects there and have watched that evolve and, and our philosophy was really that utilities should recognize that this uh, by, by choosing open standards and, and flexible platforms, they would be able to really maximize the value they got from, from this investment. So, so what happened when, when they started rolling out? Well, the first thing was that generally, homeowners and citizens were very unhappy with this. Um, the early deployments of smart metering in the US were kind of typified by picket lines and people you know, launching campaigns to stop smart metering because actually it turned out the utilities hadn't thought very much about the benefits for the homeowners, really. Uh, many utilities still called them connections rather than residents or customers. Um, and so uh, in many cases, they found that their bills went up because no one had told them their tariff was changing. So they didn't start doing their washing late at night and, and therefore, you know, their bills went up. So 
utilities had to react and one of the things they did was they enabled other companies who perhaps were better at communicating and working with, with consumers to build tools that would help consumers understand their energy consumption um, so they could actually start making savings. And that, that was very effective in helping um, people see the benefits and achieve the benefits of the smart metering. So to enable this, they actually had put in place standards for the data format and communication technologies that would allow the meter to talk to these devices or share the, the information. And, and that in turn enabled a wider ecosystem of products to emerge from home thermostats or, or other devices in the home that could take that smart metering data and use it. And the utilities found they could also use the equipment they had installed to help accelerate or improve other programs they have. So they could use the, the wireless communication network to connect up their electric vehicle charging points, for example. Or they could use the, the website that the customers had to see their energy. They could also see how efficient their solar panels were, so they could actually optimize their use. Uh, and they started also to connect up all the other assets across the grid. So their substations, they started adding monitoring points in, in all, all locations, fault detection devices that they hung on the lines to see if there was an outage. Um, and that started to give them an unprecedented view of what was happening across their network for the first time, uh, which in turn led to enabling advanced analytics so they could actually start um, detecting if a, if a homeowner's refrigerator was about to break because they could see the, comp the change in behaviour of the compressor or they could detect energy theft uh, if someone had spliced into the power lines based on the, the data that was coming back from the sensors. And so I guess the overall trend that they saw was that the, the original investment in the smart meter uh, turned out to be a platform for ongoing innovation that, that still is, is growing in value today. Um, so if we now look at cities, is, is it really the same thing that we're seeing happening there? Um, well, in part yes, but also in part no. And I think that's largely, in, in many ways, driven by how cities are organised and how they've evolved over time. They're much more organic uh, um, organisations, if you want to think of that. They're lo more loosely organised and different structured, which means it's, it's, there's more challenges there for cities to, to, to kind of take the same path that, that utilities have. Um, but what's certainly true is, as we've seen, cities are very active now in exploring how they can improve uh, services ac right across the, across the city um, using smart technology. So cities are looking to connect a whole range of different devices and these are some examples of what we're speaking to cities about today and it's really an, an ever-growing list, um, generally with an aim of improving the services they offer to their, to their citizens uh, or enabling new services actually. Um, and one thing that's interesting is we're seeing smart lighting playing a really important role in this uh, and that's largely because of the business case for LED replacement and smart lighting is very straightforward. It's very clear uh, with a predictable payback uh, based on the energy savings, which actually enables cities to move forward quickly. And we're seeing cities around the world changing their, um, their lighting to LED uh, and in the process rolling out flexible control and management platforms that they can use. Whereas if we look at many of the other use cases, they're still at a, an exploratory stage. People are trying to understand the right technology, uh, the right business models to make these work. And so um, lighting is, is, is playing a really important role. Can I ask you a question regarding that? Uh, when you say then that, so, so maybe in some of the projects, projects that you have done, um, I take, you take it that it's the lighting part <coughs> of the city, let's say, that are, have the initiative in this question a little bit because, because of the LED replacements <coughs> at the same time, and then they can yeah. uh, put more, uh, uh, put more, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think, there, so, so, so cities around the world are <coughs> making a transition to LED, and uh, an increasing number are, are using that as an opportunity to roll out a control platform. And I think now that there's, there's solutions in the market that are um, flexible and can enable a range of other benefits in parallel, that's, um, cities are, are kind of choosing that model so that they can help improve or fast track these other initiatives. But as you say, it's coming often from the lighting department and they're kind of a key stakeholder in that process. 
um, which interestingly ties with the, the changing role of a lighting department within a city. Um, um, and indeed the new technology significantly changes what lighting can do, but also what those teams are, are responsible for. So, uh, so I've picked out four trends I think that are, um, uh, the, the smart city market has been probably, the term has been around for 10 years and certainly there's been activity over the last, uh, over that period, but I think in the last three years we've really seen a, a, an increase and we're starting to move into the, the kind of next phase of, of adoption. So these are the trends we think that will inform that. So the, the first is that um, I think it's now been quite widely recognised that no one provider can give a city a smart city. Uh, to your point, you know, there's more, there's other providers available and indeed I don't think anyone, uh, the, the idea of uh, giving a, a big check to one big tech company and they'll give you a smart city, I think that, that model has been shown to not really be effective. And that's in part because every city is different. Um, while they might have the same underlying challenges, the order they want to address them, the, the, the legacy they have of, of solutions in place are different. And, um, and so as a result, there's no silver bullet for, for cities. And so increasingly we're seeing that an, an open ecosystem approach is what cities are looking for where solutions are expected to work uh, and collaborate with, um, with many other solutions either that exist today or that will come in the future with businesses of all sizes. Um, and I think a great analogy for this is if we look at the, the mobile market, if we go back 15 years, the market was dominated by players who were very trusted technology, it worked well, um, but ultimately everything was developed in-house and therefore innovation was relatively slow and incremental and they've been completely uh, superseded by those providers which have built their business model around enabling others to innovate on top of their platform so it makes innovation much faster and much more flexible and it means we all have the same phone in our pocket but each each one of us it does a hundred different things which is tailored to the way we, we live our lives and I think in the smart cities market we see that that um, that approach being the, the model that will be successful in, in our view. Uh, one example of this is um, taken from a, a project in Glasgow in the UK. So they won uh, 24 million pounds funding from the government for to build a future city demonstrator uh, where um, they, they were to showcase and, and demonstrate a range of smart city technologies um, and Rather, I don't unenviably as it was, they, they had to spend it all within one year, um, which I think was the largest challenge they, they faced. And I think what they were very successful in doing was building a program that included uh, four demonstrators, um, a, a new city operations centre, and an, a citizen open data platform. And from the outset, all these different components joined together and shared data in 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 a, a very consistent way to to try and make that a platform that could expand organically over time. Uh, specifically, we, we delivered the intelligent lighting demonstrator. So we showed how in three sites around the city, how st a street lighting network, we upgraded the, the lights to LEDs. And we showed how that network could be used to connect up a range of sensors, including traffic uh, sensors that were counting pedestrians and vehicles to adjust the lighting in real time, um, noise sensors and air quality sensors and uh, all of that data was being fed into the, um, the city's open data platform so they could make that available to third parties to, um, to innovate on top of or to, to gain access to and get a better understanding of their city. And they, they had a whole range of, this was the kind of first step and they sketched out a path of where this might go in the future and they had a whole range of additional extensions for this that they, they hope to incorporate. So, that included using the same cameras to monitor electric vehicle charging bays to determine which spaces were free around the city to help advise drivers um, or in monitor parking bays as well. Uh, they gave control of the lighting system to the emergency services. So if there was a road traffic accident, then the, the lights on that street could be put up to full brightness. Um, and one that, that I always found interesting was um, the, one of the sites was outside the central train station in Glasgow and uh, they, 
plan to use the camera to monitor the length of the taxi queue because uh, it's widely known if it's raining on a Saturday night and the queue goes past a certain point then there might well be a fight breaks out because people are waiting for more than an hour in the in the rain and so this is something the police have managed over the years and so that's something that could be automated uh, with this and automatically send some taxis perhaps before it gets to that point so um, so that was an interesting project so the next trend we're seeing is that, that cities are working very hard to find ways to change themselves uh, and work to share more effectively across the silos in the city. So it's been widely recognised that one of the biggest barriers to adoption of the technology is actually that very often environmental services don't work with traffic and perhaps they don't work with health, uh, the different teams in the city. And therefore, if you have a solution that can help many of them, how do you actually progress that? How do you, you bring that together? And so cities are really, um, many of them are challenging themselves to find ways to, to break down those silos and share more effectively. And that could be sharing budgets, but it could also just be sharing the problems that they have so people can understand, share the data that they're gathering uh, or share the knowledge that they've learned from projects that they're doing. And many cities are taking a different approach to this. Uh, one that is, is proven quite popular is to create a, uh, effectively a, a dedicated innovation area in the city um, which can, can really foster conversations between these departments. This is something that's happening um, in Stockholm region in the uh, urban ICT arena which is based in Shista and here many different technology providers are being brought together um, and uh, indeed the, the, the city are actively involved to look at how the technologies can be deployed, showcase how they can work, how they can interoperate, bringing that open ecosystem uh, aspect to the fore, and also inviting different departments in the city to really understand this and, and how they can be involved. And we think over the next two or three years, these type of initiatives are gonna be very important in helping kind of break down those barriers and giving people the confidence to move forward with, uh, with many of these new, new technologies. Um, other cities are taking a more pragmatic approach. So in Paris, they saw that they had um, two procurements coming up at the same time for communication networks, for a, a street lighting control system and a traffic signal management system. And so they combined those two procurements, which they inherently knew would mean that they would need a certain amount of, they would get a more flexible solution because to meet the two aims, they, would, they wouldn't be tied into a, a kind of single purpose solution. And so we have now rolled out a communication network across Paris, connecting up 190,000 streetlights and uh, several thousand traffic signals. And that, um, it's a wireless mesh network that's been designed to be flexible for different IoT applications, is now being used by the city to connect up a range of different use cases. And ultimately, they see that as um, a flexible asset for the city going forward that they can use to, um, to fast track and improve many of their services. So the third trend is that, again, it's recognized that becoming a smart city isn't a one-time fix. It's not something that you plan, you execute, and then you can sit back and relax because you're now a smart city. In fact, um, it's more of a change of mindset and cities adopting a different process so that they can um, continue to evolve and adopt technology. And I think that's partly influenced by the technology cycle becoming so much shorter as we, we heard about. Uh, new technology used to perhaps emerge, impactful technology every 10, 20 years. Um, now that, that cycle is every 18 months and so cities need to change how, they, how they're operating. Um, so that means planning that the solutions they deploy will change over time. Uh, so simple things such as being able to upgrade the, the firmware and the software on the devices that they deploy in the field because we expect that they will evolve um, over time as new features are available or uh, perhaps security needs to be upgraded. Um, and also linked to that, changing how cities engage with technology companies, um, how they structure contracts and, and how they shape those procurements with a plan that the solution they're buying today will actually evolve over time. And indeed, they might need these different programs to somehow work together in the future in a way that they, don't, they can't predict today. Uh, an example of that is in um, Copenhagen. So again, there we 
won the contract for connecting the new lighting control system, so 20,000 lights across the system, sorry, across the city, with a primary aim of uh, reducing energy and, and reducing carbon emissions. And shortly after that was deployed, they recognised there was, there was a conflict between the, um, the, the lighting programme, which was effectively reducing lighting levels late at night to save energy, and the cycling initiatives that were really trying to promote more cyclists on the road. And so the city helped foster a collaboration between us and the provider of the traffic signal control system. And we put in place a system that um, we have sensors watching the bike lanes at junctions. And so as cyclists set off from the traffic lights, the street lights above them will go brighter. So they're more visible to drivers who might otherwise have jumped the lights. Um, and uh, that was delivered as a collaborative project uh, with, with the traffic signal controller um, provider. Um, we, we do think that while this will be an evolving process, uh, some things need to be given consideration up front uh, to be thought of in a, a kind of prior to going on this journey. And security and privacy are, are probably the main ones because security is very hard to retrofit um, once things have gone wrong. And increasingly, as we see more systems uh, overlapping, and sharing data, then effectively the, the consistency of security becomes more important. And there's now many examples of security of IoT or smart systems being compromised. And I think this wasn't really a, hu a very high priority for cities two or three years ago, which surprised us coming from the smart grid market where it's very high priority for utilities. Um, but I think now as cities are moving from trial phase to city-wide scale, uh, it's really being recognised as an important factor. And it's often said, well, why would someone want to hack a street lighting system or a weather station system or, you know, some new system that's deployed? Um, but the reality is people will always find uh, a reason, whether it's just for their own entertainment um, uh, or, or whether it's for some other malicious purpose. And uh, so we think this will continue to become more important as time goes on. <coughs> so the final trend um, that we're pleased to see actually is that increasingly the citizens again are being put at the, the core of kind of why these things are, are moving forward. Uh, focus is moving away from the technology itself and looking at the benefits and how it will change life for citizens, which I think will be key to the, to the adoption of these systems. And you know, there's various ways that, that manifests itself. So kind of more careful attention to exploring the needs of citizens. Again, if, I, if we look in Copenhagen with their street lighting upgrade, if, we, if you ask the city what part they're kind of proudest of, very often they'll reference the lighting master plan that was done after the contract was awarded, where they walked uh, all over the city with the contractor that had won the contract and spoke to businesses and residents to understand what, you know, we're changing the lighting in Copenhagen to, to address energy uh, savings. What else could we be fixing at the same time? And they found subtle ways of improving the lighting and um, uh, around the city, which they were very proud to be doing. Uh, Cities are changing the way they interact with their citizens as well. So they are uh, enabling new tools so they can get a direct contact with citizens to identify issues, whether it's a pothole or, or some other issue in the city. And indeed, some cities, uh, Moscow, for example, are putting in place a voting system where uh, the app can be sent uh, to a local area and said, would you like us to fix this broken bus stop or repair that pothole in the road? And residents will vote so they can get some priority when budgets are constrained. That's you know, quite a novel way of, of, uh, of tackling that. And I think there's also, we're seeing that these systems, again, are, are looking at the benefits right across the board. So this is a, a view of um, a project we're involved in in, in, the, in the US, in, in Florida. And this is the largest street lighting, uh, smart street lighting project in the world with over half a million street lights. They're being deployed at 7,000 units per week. So it's very complex logistical challenge. But we spent a huge amount of time talking about 
637 of these lights. And that was because they appeared in the breeding area for um, turtles. And um, the problem that turtles face is that when the hatchlings are born, they navigate by the moon. And so if the street lights are too bright, they will walk, instead of going to the sea, they'll go towards the road. And that doesn't end up, end up well for them. And so the, 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 the city here, and in fact, the utility that we're rolling these out, put in place special controls in the software so that on certain days of the year, the lights will automatically be dimmed in these areas to protect the turtles. And it's, I guess, an interesting example of a, a very specific local feature that, that perhaps you wouldn't expect to see uh, in, in many other parts, but is really important for them locally. And f final, final slide is really that there's also an increased kind of recognition that cities are supposed to be fun. And this is, a, this is from a, a project that took place in Bristol in the UK, where streetlights were actually hijacked around the city, where the light uh, source was replaced with a projector and a, a camera, which replayed the shadows of people that walked by, um, much to the confusion and, uh, and uh, perhaps initial, initially some reservations by, by the people who, you know, trying to understand what was going on. But, quick, <laughs> but quickly they found that people were dancing in dark alleys that perhaps previously hadn't been, uh, hadn't been comfortable to walk down and generally felt more connected to their, to, their, uh, to their city. And I think initiatives like this are a great reminder that you know, the cities of the future should be fun places for, for us to live. I don't think many of us look um, forward to the dystopian view that many science fiction films portray. And so finding ways to make them more engaging and, and, and more connected to their citizens is going to be very important. So that's me. So thanks very much and very welcome to take questions.